start off by talking about some, a few of the things that I studied uh, early in my career, uh, and then uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the things uh, we're excited about now in my lab, where our focus is uh, largely on how life got started uh, when our planet was very young. Uh, so it's a fun field because it combines physics and chemistry and geology and uh, biology. And, uh, it's, it's just uh, like all of the things in science, it's, it's full of uh, fascinating puzzles. So, uh, and, and what you see on the, the diagram uh, on this slide is our imagination of what a really, really simple cell might have looked like, like the first cells that uh, assembled on the early Earth. And, and later on, I'll tell you about how we're trying to build uh, primitive cells uh, in the lab. But uh, before I get to that, let me tell you about some of the things uh, I worked on when I was much younger. Actually, almost uh, your age, when I was uh, in college at uh, the Field University of Montreal, Canada, uh, I I worked in many different labs for a while to sort of learn about different areas, and then I was very lucky to get into a, a, a great biology lab, uh, which uh, where the focus was on the study of algae and how they grow, how they, uh, you know, how they uh, propagate in wild environments. And I got uh, fascinated by uh, the study of this organism, uh, Eudorina elegans. It's a very small, simple green alga. It's, you may have heard of Volvox, which is it's a larger relative. Uh, and uh, I worked with on, on, on the, a project uh, studying this uh, green alga with uh, my best friend in, in high school or college. And uh, when we studied, we were studying this uh, relatively simple organism. We, we actually uh, discovered that it secretes a hormone uh, which accumulates when the population gets to a high enough density. And then it triggers uh, reproductive differentiation. So that was uh, like incredibly exciting. So I think one of the things I want to try to get across is that when you discover something new for the first time, uh, it's just uh, there's no feeling like it. I mean, it's uh, it's very addictive. And once once we knew we had found something new that no one had ever seen before, I think I was hooked on uh, science for the rest of my life. And so that was very good, but I have to tell you uh, that one of the consequences was not so great because I got so excited about the potential of working on this obscure organism that when I uh, went to Cornell University for graduate school to start my PhD uh, work, I brought this with me and I went to a, a plant physiology lab and uh, my professor at the time was uh, kind of kind enough to let me keep working on this. And I had a kind of grandiose vision uh, that I could use this as a very simple system to study the genetics of development. Uh, because it has a very simple uh, stereotyped reproducible set of cell division, just shape changes, uh, and the problem was that I didn't really know any genetics at the time. I wanted to use this as a genetic system. Uh, but use genetics to study their problems. So I ended up in a place where I had no one to talk to, no one to help me solve problems when experiments didn't work. And it was basically a pretty terrible uh, year and a half of, of my life until I finally, finally decided this is not working. I dropped the project uh, with another friend who came up with another big idea, and I actually transferred to a different laboratory to try to go off in a different direction. 
and uh, that was also difficult at first, but uh, but then my advisor was extremely helpful. When he saw that I was having trouble with my project, which involved a bit of chemistry, he sent me to a different lab where I learned how to do things properly. Back home, I was able to finish that project, get my PhD, and move on. And so that led to uh, kind of a long, long period in my early scientific life when I was studying this organism, which is the common yeast, baker's yeast, or brewer's yeast. Uh, and I studied two main aspects of this organism. Um, back in those days, which was uh, roughly 40 years ago, uh, it wasn't really known how to get DNA into cells so that you could add new genes or make mutations or manipulate the genome the way you could easily do it now with so many organisms. Back then, uh, people had actually, uh, in a different lab, had just discovered how to get DNA into yeast cells. And it was very hard, not very reproducible, uh, a very rare event, so it was a little difficult. So with uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, in, in that lab, uh, Rod Rusty, we started playing around with it. And uh, kind of almost by accident, we discovered that if you, so, so what, it, let me back up, what we had been trying to do was to take circular pieces of DNA, plasmid DNA, right, and introduce that into the cell. It wasn't working. And almost by accident, we found that if you break the DNA, so now you have your circle and you open it up, sometimes you, we could get thousands of times more uh, transformed cells which had taken up the DNA. And so I really liked that because it's so counterintuitive, right? You would think if you break something, it's going to work worse. But actually, it works thousands of times better. And so we spent. Uh, uh, quite a few years uh, studying that, trying to understand uh, what was going on. And it turned out that it was an example of a process that's really important in cells. If you break a piece of DNA, like if you cause a break in a chromosome, it can repair that break as long as there is an unbroken equivalent strand, what we call homologous recombination or double strand DNA break repair. It's a very fundamental and important process in all cells. And we had kind of stumbled on that by accident in our experiments with yeast. Uh, so it was very technically useful uh, and uh, also very intellectually challenging to understand the process because it's quite complicated. And, and uh, actually, people are still studying this process now 40 years later. So there is still more to discover about the biochemistry of how DNA molecules repair uh, damage to themselves, or how cells repair the damage to their DNA. So while I was working on this, I, uh, I went to a small meeting. We, we have these uh, meetings called Gordon Conferences, which are very nice scientific meetings because they're restricted to maybe 100 people or 150 people. So they're small enough that you get to hear interesting things, you can find people, talk to them. And so I went to one of these meetings, and I heard an amazing talk uh, by a woman named Elizabeth Blackburn. And Liz uh, was working on this funny-looking organism here uh, called Tetrahymen. Uh, this, uh, uh, this organism grows in shallow ponds in the summer. Uh, it's, uh, it's sometimes she calls it just pond scum. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's played a big role in, in biology uh, because it, 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 it has, it's a very strange organism. It has two kinds of nuclei. This is the, oops, uh, let's see. This blue patch is the macronucleus, a big nucleus. And in it, its DNA has been chopped up into thousands of small pieces. But those, the ends of those pieces 
don't get repaired, they don't get fixed or joined back together, they're stable as ends. So it was very surprising, very unusual behavior. And uh, Liz found that the DNA at the end of these chopped up pieces of the genome was just hundreds of repeats of this uh, uh, simple sequence here. So, you know, we thought there's something interesting going on here because, you know, these ends are, are behaving like normal chromosome ends, not, not like sort of accidentally broken ends of DNA. But on the other hand, this organism is so weird, it's so different, it's so far removed in an evolutionary sense from us or from most other uh, organisms. And uh, it wasn't really clear, is this something general? Uh, and it's also kind of hard to study uh, biochemically. So that's when I got uh, involved. I went up to talk to Liz. We started, had a great chat. Uh, we decided we would collaborate and uh, see if, uh, if these DNA ends might work at yeast. And it might be a way to get to study the ends of chromosomes called telomeres in yeast. So, Neither of us really thought it would work, so, so I didn't start on it right away. Uh, but eventually, I don't know, I had a little bit of spare time, so, so I started playing around with it. And when I put this DNA into yeast, it was able to act like a stable DNA end, just like the ends of a chromosome. And, uh, and I got this. Um, so that led to a whole series of experiments. Uh, and what we, one of the key things that we found is that the ends of chromosomes in yeast also have repeats, but they're not the same as the ends in this organism. And that led to more experiments and questions, and eventually we made the hypothesis that organisms might have a special enzyme. And now it's called telomerase that adds DNA to the ends of the chromosome, and it counterbalances the gradual loss of DNA from chromosome ends. So it allows cells to keep growing through multiple divisions. That, uh, to our complete surprise, turned out to be really important in two major areas of biology. One is in aging. So many of our cells, stem cells, have to keep dividing, right? But they can only divide a certain number of times because they don't have much of this enzyme. Their telomeres get short. Eventually, the cells die. So that's one of many things that contribute to making us, uh, you know, uh, get older and 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 uh, you know, not able to regenerate our tissues. The other area is the exact opposite of that. In cancer, tumor cells, their special property is that they can keep dividing forever, right? And so tumor masses grow and, until they kill uh, the person they're in. And the reason is that almost in almost all cases, tumor cells start making more of that enzyme, that telomerase enzyme. Uh, and, and so, that is, that is why, even though at the time we, were, we discovered this, we were just excited about discovering a new aspect of the biochemistry of DNA replication. Because it turned out to be important for these other things, 25 years later, the, Liz, her student, and me uh, shared the Nobel Prize. So it just goes to show that you can be studying something just because it's interesting and not with any view to what it's applied to or what its larger scale meaning might be. And it can, you know, things can just turn out to be much more important than you ever realized. Okay. So uh, after studying that for a while, um, I kind of, well, I, I started to feel like there were so many people doing experiments in this limited area um, that nothing I did mattered anymore. If I thought of an experiment and did it in my lab, okay, someone else 
you know, if I didn't do it, someone else would do it anyway next week or next month. And we're only here once for a short time um, in our lives. And so it's kind of depressing to think that uh, it didn't matter. Anything I did would be done anyway. So I started to think maybe I should do something different. And I started to think about that. I actually spent a couple of years thinking about it. Uh, I started uh, taking courses in different areas of science that I felt like I needed to learn more and maybe I would hear something that would point me in a new direction. Uh, some of the courses I took, you know, things seemed uh, like the math was too hard for me. Um, I was very excited about some aspects of neuroscience, uh, but at that time, the tools to study how the brain works were so limited. I, I felt there was nothing much that I could do there. It's a totally different situation now. The technology has evolved so much. I think if I was a young student, I might be going into neuroscience. But at the time, it seemed kind of premature. Um, but I started to learn about how enzymes worked. Um, fantastic course by, given by Jeremy Knowles at Harvard. And coincidentally, at the same time, uh, Tom Check and a few others had just figured out that RNA molecules could act like enzymes. Right? So how many of you know about RNA? What RNA is? Most of you, okay. So just for the, so everyone's on the same page, you know, DNA is our genetic molecule of inheritance. RNA is chemically very similar and plays many roles in cells, right? It's the, the message that uh, takes the information in DNA and uses it for, to code for protein synthesis. Um, many roles of RNA in cells, but the idea that RNA could act like an enzyme was quite shocking at the time. And actually, Tom Chuck and Sid Altman got the Nobel Prize a few years later for their fantastic discovery. And I, was, I thought this was super interesting. I thought it was so cool that you know, lots and lots of people would start studying uh, how RNA can catalyze chemical reactions, just like protein enzymes. So I was kind of surprised that almost nobody started doing that. I still don't know why, because I still think it's so interesting. Uh, and so I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll switch my lab over and, and start studying the biochemistry of RNA. Um, and so I've pretty much been doing that ever since in, in, in different ways. Uh, how many people here have heard of CRISPR? CRISPR-Cas genome editing. Okay, so that uh, system, you may, have, you may have heard that uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for studying CRISPR because it's such an efficient way of editing genomes. Anyway, Jennifer was the first student in my lab to start helping me work with RNA. Uh, so that was a fantastic way to begin a, a new direction. She was an amazing student, and she's an incredible scientist and uh, an amazing person. So uh, with Jennifer's help, uh, and then I started uh, recruiting other fabulous uh, students to the lab to work on different aspects of RNA chemistry. And one of the things that uh, we decided to do was to see if we could use the principles of evolution to make new RNA enzymes or to make RNA uh, molecules that could do things that we wanted them to do. So, so, you know, if you've been learning about Darwinian evolution, the usual context is in the evolution of organisms, right? You'll have a population of organisms, uh, they may be experiencing, for example, some environmental stress. Uh, there might be rare mutants that allow some of those mutant organisms to cope better with that stress. They will start to take over the population while the others tend to die off. 
And so you, you can evolve new traits, which involve new sequences, by continually having uh, replication and selection. So it turns out you can do exactly that with populations of molecules. All that you need is to have the technology to make more copies of a given molecule. And for RNA and DNA, that's very easy to do using the enzymes of replication or transcription. Uh, and it's easy in the lab to select for molecules that can do certain things. For example, bind to a target or catalyze a reaction. I'll just show you uh, one example. Um, this is an RNA molecule that we evolved in my lab in, uh, what, 30 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's shown as a, an image of how it looks when it's folded up in three dimensions. And on the surface, there's a, a little sort of shallow cleft on the surface, which is complementary to the shape of the molecule that it binds, which is, which is ATP. This is just one of uh, many examples. Uh, uh, we, were, we were just having fun evolving RNAs that could do all kinds of different things. Um, bind all kinds of small molecules. Uh, but at the same time, a, a different lab, uh, Larry Gold's lab, uh, was evolving aptamers that could bind to protein targets. And, and he and many others are still exploring the possibility that those those molecules called aptamers might be, they're similar in principle to antibodies, and so maybe they can be used in, in uh, disease therapies or diagnostics. Uh, and uh, we also uh, played around with evolving RNA molecules that could uh, actually cop uh, do the basic chemistry of replication. Okay. Uh, and and actually, other labs are still working on that. So, uh, so at the time, um, we found that evolving RNA molecules was fairly easy. We then showed you could evolve even DNA molecules to do similar things. Um, then I started to get interested in, uh, well, could you, evolve molecule, could you evolve protein molecules to do things that you want, not just rely on what nature supplies? And that's a little bit more uh, tricky. Uh, I'll try to explain. Um, because protein molecules are coded by the information in DNA, right, which is transferred to RNA. And then a huge complicated machine called the ribosome, which is diagrammed by these, these, these two uh, structures here, translates that information into a sequence of amino acids in a peptide. So, once that protein is synthesized, it's normally separated from the RNA that has the information. Right? And so if a protein does something that you like, there's no way normally to go back and get the information so that you can amplify it and make more of the mutant protein. So we worked out a trick where we could keep the protein chemically attached to the message that encodes it. And so that way, if you have a sequence of RNA here that encodes for a protein that does what you want, they're attached. You can get the RNA with the information, you can amplify it, and you can use it to make more protein. And you can go through rounds of selecting for the protein to do what you want, but always knowing the RNA sequence that coded for it. So that allowed us to evolve proteins that could do things we want, like bind small molecules or catalyze reactions. Okay, so we worked on that for a while, and then, then uh, you know, I was interested in whether we could get things that were actually useful as, for example, therapeutics. And so that brought in new challenges. Um, we actually started a company to explore that. Um, that was a very interesting educational experience for me because it was a complete disaster. We raised tens of millions of dollars and we didn't really get anywhere. <laughs> and so the company went bankrupt. And so then it was kind of back to the lab and well, can we come up with something new maybe that would work better? And uh, so 
we worked for quite a while on how to make small peptides that had a different chemistry from the peptides that you find in our cells. Yeah, question. Okay, so, so the question is whether, um, I think really the question is whether manipulating our genome has serious implications, and of course it does. Uh, there's a huge debates about whether that should be allowed at all or, or not. Um, and it's difficult because there are clear cases where it could be medically useful, uh, but on the other hand, do we really want we probably don't want to change our own evolution, or maybe we do. So that's a big controversy. What we were doing was just manipulating DNA molecules or RNA molecules in solution in the lab, not affecting any organism. Right? So I think that was kind of a separate thing. What benefit did you gain from that then? So the benefit we got from our experiments is just understanding something about how RNA works, what it can do, uh, what it's... You know, everybody was used to thinking of RNA as a, just a string, an unfolded linear string, right? No one was really thinking about the fact that, like, like peptides, it could fold up into three-dimensional shapes that do very different things. So we really just, we were getting really fundamental understanding of how uh, RNA works, what it can do. All right, any other questions at this point? Okay, so, so continuing with the theme of evolving new molecules in the lab, uh, we worked out ways of making small peptides with amino acids that are not found in biology. And uh, we were gradually able to get closer and closer to molecules that kind of looked like they could be drugs. And so it's a long way from doing this kind of basic work in an academic lab to actually making a compound that could treat a disease in humans. So we started another company uh, that worked on this technology. And they actually were able to use it to make molecules that are in clinical trials to treat different kinds of diseases. And actually, the technology is really starting to spread, and uh, more people are gradually starting to use it. So that was very satisfying. But really, I've always been much more interested in very fundamental questions. I didn't want to just shift into doing uh, applied science. I think it's, it's, it's fun and interesting to get that going, but my approach is to get that out into companies where people have the resources to develop uh, the applications of a technology. And so around that time, I started to think more about how evolution itself got started, right? In the lab, we can evolve RNA molecules, we can evolve DNA molecules, we can evolve proteins and modified peptides. But it's easy in the lab because you have like super smart students, like like you guys, and we have fancy instruments, and we have enzymes, and we have like all the tools you could want in order to do evolutionary experiments in the lab. But somehow, uh, the process of evolution got started all by itself, very early on in the history of our planet, and gave rise to life, which has been evolving for four billion years, and, and that's, you know, that's why we're here, right? So, I started to think about that more and more and more, and I've gradually uh, switched my lab over to the study of how life itself began when our planet was young, which it really is the, the same thing. It's another way of saying, how did evolution begin? Okay, so um, 
let me just say a little bit about you know when this might have happened, right? And there's I, everything about this. There are enormous questions, and there's really so little we know. Um, but we do know that the Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. You know, at the time it was a, a, basically a molten mass of, of metal and rock. Um, it took maybe 100 million years to cool down enough so that there could be liquid water on the surface. And maybe another 100 million years after that before you could start to have interesting chemistry going on on the surface of the planet. And then, it's not really well shown here, but there's a gap of maybe actually 700 million years between when we think that life, the earliest time that life could possibly have started, and when we actually have evidence for life on the early Earth. So there's a huge time in there. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Some people think that 700 million years is a very short time for life to get started. Personally, 700 million years seems like a long time to me. And, and so I, I think that you know, life started on our planet, didn't come from anywhere else. It started when the conditions for uh, the right kinds of chemistry uh, emerged. And that led to a period uh, when the building blocks of biology uh, could be made on the surface of the planet. And then once those were around and in the right conditions, they could start to assemble into larger molecules like RNA molecules, which could start to uh, replicate spontaneously just using chemistry and eventually give rise to very, very simple forms of life uh, it's a period in the history of life called the RNA world when we think the, the genome of primitive cells was made of little bits of RNA uh, long before the evolution of DNA or proteins or peptides. And eventually, the evolution of those cells gave rise to more complicated cells, gradually up to things like bacteria and, and ultimately billions of years later to us. Okay, so I've been really interested in this early, early period where the building blocks of biology were first made, and then the questions we're studying in my lab are, how did those molecules get together to form living cells? Okay. All right. This, of course, is very closely related to a what seems like a very different question, which is, you know, is there life out there on other planets? And so we know now from uh, advances in astronomy that there are, you know, most stars have planets. And so in our galaxy alone, there must be billions of planets, just so very similar to ours. Uh, this is a video from, from NASA that shows a particular uh, solar system where there are two planets that orbit the star uh, in a, at a distance where there could be water on the surface. Right? So as far as we could tell, there could be life there. You know, we have no idea, actually, if there actually is life on either of these planets or any of the others. There are thousands that have been cataloged now. We'd all love to know if there's life out there, right? And, and so part of the answer to that is, well, how easy or hard is it for life to get started? If it's a really easy chemical process, then maybe there's life on almost every Earth-like planet out there. But it could be that it's actually really difficult chemically to make the right molecules or to have them come together in the right way. In which case, we might be the only planet in the whole universe that has life. And we just, we don't know. So, so half of the astronomy community uh, now is trying to detect signs of life uh, out there in, in, around other stars. Uh, and what we're doing is trying to see from laboratory experiments whether it's easy or hard to, get, to make life from chemicals. Okay. Now, the study of how life got started itself has a long history. 
And one of the key experiments occurred about 70 years ago. Uh, this is the famous Miller-Urey experiment that was actually done at the University of Chicago, where I am now. And what, um, well, the story is quite interesting because Stanley Miller was a very young graduate student. Uh, he, had, he was working in the laboratory of uh, a famous uh, physicist chemist named Harold Urey, who had won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of deuterium, the heavy isotope of hydrogen. Uh, and Stanley said that he wanted to do an experiment where you make an atmosphere like what they thought the atmosphere of the early Earth was at the time, and then supply energy in the form of an electric spark and see what kinds of chemistry happened. Would you make anything related to biology? And his boss, Harold Urey, said, don't do it. That's a stupid experiment. It'll never work. But fortunately, uh, Stanley was determined, and he did it anyways. And, and he's, he was, became immediately famous because they found that in all of the chemistry going on, they, they were starting to make things like amino acids. So that experiment proved that at least some of the fundamental building blocks of biology are just incredibly easy to make. Right? It was a total shock. Uh, and, and it is really the beginning of the field of that we now call prebiotic chemistry. How, how are the molecules of life actually made on a young planet? OK. So let me tell you a little bit more about that chemistry. The most um, satisfying aspect of it to me, because it's so ironic and counterintuitive, is that the best molecule to use as the starting point for making everything we need to build biology is hydrogen cyanide. So one of the most poisonous and toxic chemicals that we know is actually fantastic for the origins of life. It has hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen. And then you have oxygen from water, of course. So that gives you most of what you need to make most of our organic uh, compounds. And the chemistry of this simple molecule is just surprisingly rich and complex. And one of my colleagues, John Sutherland, who works in the UK, has been studying this now for decades and has come up with a whole network of chemical reactions that can make sugars, nucleotides, uh, lipids, amino acids, peptides, everything you want can come basically from cyanide. OK. So uh, there are many puzzles left there. Uh, but we're starting to get a feel for how you can make all the right starting materials. And so the question I'm interested in now is if you've got all the right chemicals, right? any chemical you want, say you have it, how do, you, how do they come together to make a living cell? That's, that's the fundamental puzzle we're working on. So um, of course, you're not going to make a cell like any cell you see now, right? All cells now on the, on, on the Earth now are incredibly complicated. They have thousands of genes, thousands of enzymes. So early life couldn't be complicated like that. It had to be really simple. So what we think is that the first cells were kind of like modern cells in that they had a lipid uh, membrane uh, boundary, like a compartment made of basically of soap-like molecules, and inside, short bits of RNA that can code for useful properties in their sequence. Now the trick, so it turns out that actually building structures like this is really easy. Right. Membranes self-assemble. RNA strands essentially self-assemble. The hard part is how do they replicate, right? The cells have to grow and divide, right? So that because for evolution, you need replication. So you have to have growth and division of the membrane, but without any evolved machinery. No proteins, nothing, because there's been no evolution yet. And the same thing for the RNA. These molecules have to replicate, but without any enzymes. Right? because there's no evolved machinery. And so it's how to get those processes working just using the principles of chemistry and physics that has been driving us for two decades now. 
So I'm just going to show you two movies. The first one is uh, a kind of simplified view of how we think that RNA might get copied just using chemistry. And, and so this is a video animation. And the idea is we would have little bits of RNA floating around in a very chemically rich environment, including activated nucleotides, the building blocks of RNA, and that these building blocks would find their complementary partner in the RNA chain by base pairing, and then click into place because of the chemistry uh, that they have, and build up a complementary strand. Okay. And so we've been working on that for a long time. We've made a lot of progress. We're not all the way there to having cycles of copying, but I think we're getting close. Um, the other part is this membrane compartment that also has to grow and divide. That turns out to be really interesting. And there are actually lots of ways of making it happen. I'll just show you a movie of, of one. So this is a whole bunch of these lipid compartments. They contain green labeled RNA on the inside. We add more uh, lipids, fatty acids, and you can see the shapes start to change and fluctuate. Right? And as the surface area grows and the shapes are fluctuating, little daughter uh, vesicles bud off the parental ones. And so growth and division can happen really easily, just spontaneously. We still don't understand exactly how this works. Right? So it's like every, like in science, you know, everything you discover leads to more questions. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out how this, how this works. We're trying to Ultimately, we'd like to combine chemically replicating RNA molecules inside chemically replicating uh, vesicles. That should be a recipe for evolution. And that's our goal. Yes? <laughs> you want to join my lab? That's a very good question. <laughs> yes. We can make a copy, we get a double-stranded product, but that's not replication. Then you have to get those strands apart and copy them, right? And so you have a cycle. And we're, we have, I think, a pretty good idea of how to do that. But yeah, that's one of the things we're working on. That's a really great question. Yeah, OK. So assuming that we can combine all of these things uh, together, uh, we should have essentially what we call a protocell, something that can grow and divide, uh, can, have, uh, can have mutations, it should be able to evolve. And what I hope that we get to see sometime in the next few years is the beginnings of evolution in, in a simplified system that kind of mimics how we think life might have started on the early Earth. And let me just show uh, one more thing, which is even if we understood all the chemistry and physics of how to do this in the lab, we still wouldn't understand how life got started, right? To do that, we have to understand something about the right geological environment. That's a little tricky because there's not much evidence left for the environments on the very early Earth. But we know some general principles, and we know that we need an environment on the surface where you get the energy of UV ultraviolet radiation. Uh, on the surface, you can concentrate things, uh, which is very important. And we're pretty sure you need an environment with lots of change, fluctuations, maybe temperature, hot and cold, you know, wet and dry cycles, that kind of thing. So we're thinking about surface environments sources of energy, places you could accumulate uh, the right starting materials. And that's turning our attention to volcanic regions or uh, impact craters. And so my hope is that we'll be able to put uh, all of the chemistry that we and my colleagues have discovered together with this kind of thinking about the geology of the early Earth, and then really have some kind of basic understanding of how uh, life got started. OK, so uh, I think I will uh, stop there and just uh, open this up to any questions you might have.
Do you want people to use the mic so everyone can hear? Do, uh, okay, there's a question there. Yeah. Might, might be good for people to wait for the microphone so everyone can hear. Um, first of all, thank you for your lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Ria Chadha. I'm from Delhi. And my question is about uh, the, the experiment that you had mentioned that Miller did, the production of amino acids under primitive yeah. earth conditions. Mm -hmm. How exactly did he uh, manage to replicate those conditions? And like, what were those conditions? OK. So uh, it's actually it's a very interesting story. So at the time, 70 years ago, people thought for various reasons that the Earth's atmosphere would be would consist of things like hydrogen, methane, ammonia, what we call a reducing atmosphere. It's it's a great it's a great recipe for doing this kind of chemistry. Uh, and, and so that was why they set it up that way. It's based on what they thought the early atmosphere would be like. Um, this experiment actually kind of went out of fashion when geologists said, actually, that's not very reasonable. That early atmosphere would, would have been lost because ultraviolet radiation destroys most of those chemicals rather quickly. And volcanic outgassing uh, gives you mostly carbon dioxide and nitrogen and things like that, which is very hard to do interest in chemistry with. And so that was a puzzle for a long time. People thought maybe that Miller-Urey experiment's not relevant to anything. And then in the last 10 years, it's come back into fashion because now uh, we're, people are realizing that when there's a, a very large impact, uh, like a comet or a, or a very big meteorite hits the surface of the planet, uh, it can actually change the chemistry of the whole atmosphere and bring back that kind of reducing atmosphere. So, so yeah, it's still, people are, it's still controversial. People are still thinking about it. But Thank that's, you. that's the history. Uh, let's see, I think. Is this working? Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, so my question isn't directly related to your lecture, but it's more about your work. Uh, mm -hmm. So since you've worked with genes a lot, I wanted to ask if you think that speciation in humans is possible. Like, I feel uh, since our way of thinking, it's way different than any other species on Earth. I think it causes, it, co it provides us with a few advantages. Like, even if we use a hypothetical case where we separated two humans, like two continents from each other, speciation still won't be possible. Well, wow. um, yeah, uh, I'm not really sure. I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, I think it's a very a hard thing to think about. It's also, of course, not really possible to study experimentally. Uh, I think, you know, if suppose we uh, discover other planets or other stars, right, and, and send out spaceships to colonize other planets, uh, I think over time, you know, evolution would cause divergence and we would become different species. Together on our planet with lots of uh, mixing, I think that's much less likely. But, you know, with all the tools for gene manipulation now, it's like now we're in control of our own evolution. And whether that's for good or for bad remains to be seen. Is it, uh, yeah. I mean, if we look at different races, right, we see that they have specific features that are in correspondence with the area they originate from, like the weather around that area. But they're still not speciated. So right, right. I think like, we just, uh, we kind of accommodate ourselves to evolve to our geographical location. But I don't think we can speciate, even if we colonize another uh, planet. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, it's a matter of how much genetic mixing there is and time scales of migration. So yeah, I don't think we're going to diverge into different species on, on, on this planet, at least. I'm Auguste, I'm from Mumbai, I'm in grade 10. 
so so it's a bit irrelevant but you talked about the role of telomerase in uh, cancer yeah. so is there any way to um, inhibit that enzyme or hormone to like treat cancer as well yeah so the question is whether there's a way to inhibit the enzyme telomerase as a way of treating cancer and many many people have worked on that over many years now um, and it's been very difficult. You can inhibit the enzyme, but then it turns out cancer cells are very clever, in a sense, uh, that there are alternative pathways for making telomeres longer. And so the effect of inhibiting the enzyme actually doesn't usually last very long. So it has not been very effective. So one possibility is that if you can inhibit the telomerase pathway and also inhibit the alternative pathways, maybe something like that could be effective in theory. Um, so, but no one has been able to work out ways of knocking out all of the alternative pathways. Uh, and of course, you wouldn't want to have the bad effect of leading to premature aging as well. But you, that may be not much of a worry if you're trying to treat a, a, a cancer. So, yeah, people are working on it still. Hello, sir. Ah, yes. My name is Aditya Chaudhary, and I am from Mumbai. My question to you was: What led you to shift from researching telomeres, uh, telomeres work for which you received a Nobel Prize? to researching the origins of life? Yeah, it, it was basically, uh, <laughs> it, it was basically a combination of things. You know, uh, uh, as I said, in, in the telomerase area, uh, there were many people coming into the field. And, and so it was the feeling that there's too much competition and we wouldn't be able to contribute anything unique. But on the other hand, it's also the positive thing is that, you know, there are many, many interesting questions in science. And there's absolutely no reason why you have to study one thing your whole life, right? If you get interested in some, some new question, it can be a lot of fun to go off in a different direction, which is what I did. Now, my, my two partners in crime for that early discovery have stayed in the telomere field the entire time. And they've also made many new discoveries. So there's no right way or wrong way to do it. I just got interested in different things. Good evening, sir. My name is Krishan. I'm from New Delhi. So first of all, thank you for your talk. I found it really interesting and it was really amazing to hear from you since I respect you a lot for your work. So my question for you today is, can RNA catalyze its own replica uh, replication? Yeah, can R RNA catalyze its own replication? So that is a question that uh, we and others have been interested in now for 30 years, plus, plus or minus. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jerry Joyce, has been studying that exact question for a long time now, and he's been gradually evolving an RNA enzyme that was first discovered in my lab as an enzyme that can just join two pieces of RNA together, right? And then my student, Dave Bartel, evolved it into a very, well, not very good RNA polymerase, but still, an RNA polymerase that could start the process. And Jerry's been using evolution to make that enzyme better and better. So they now have an RNA molecule that's an RNA polymerase that's almost good enough to copy its own sequence. Not quite, but I think they're getting close. So then we come back to the question that was asked over here. Is OK, you make a copy. Now you have a double-stranded RNA. Now you have to copy the copies. How do you do that? So I think there will be a way. But we have to see, right? It's an active area. It's a, such an interesting question. It's an active area of study. 
So, so to separate the strands, the usual strategy is to heat things up, like almost to boiling, the strands come apart. Um, the problem is when you cool them down, the strands come back together <laughs> to make the RNA duplex again. And so, uh, so that's a difficult step. Um, our solution has been to work with fairly small pieces that are easy to get apart. And so uh, there are different strategies. There has to be a way. We just have to figure out the right way to do it. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, my name is Anshul Bhatt, and I study in grade 9 in Mumbai. So I had two questions for you. Uh, firstly, I read that uh, as humans age, uh, the telomeres in our cells slowly deplete, and that right. leads to the formation of senescent cells that cause right. uh, you know, diabetes and kidney failure. That is correct. Uh, and you mentioned Well, wow. no, that's a good question. Yeah. So, so the idea of um, uh, somehow uh, preventing telomere shortening as a way of essentially leading to you know, blocking aging uh, was you know, one of the early ideas in the field. But the difficulty is that if you could do that, you would have to do it in a very careful way, right? Because if you, if you do that to all cells in the body, then whenever a tumor cell arises, it will be able to keep growing indefinitely. And so, so you try to prevent aging, you make it more likely to get cancer, right? You try to prevent cancer, you make it more likely to have aging problems. Understood. So Thank you. you know, and uh, my other question was that, uh, like uh, you discussed Miller's experiment, how did the amino acids that were formed in that experiment lead to the formation of DNA and eventually ri life? Like, what was the process uh, between those two events? Sorry, I, I didn't catch the question. Uh, when amino acids formed on early Earth, how did they eventually combine and lead to the formation of complex life? Oh, that, <laughs> that's a very deep question. It's a long way from making amino acids to then peptides to then our kind of complex life. So the key step there is the evolution of coded peptide or protein synthesis, right? And, and this is a huge mystery because that's such a complex process, right? There are so many steps, so many different RNAs involved. Uh, really nobody knows. But I think there are some interesting hypotheses recently uh, to sort of connect RNA biochemistry with the beginnings of maybe making peptides that eventually could lead to making them in a coded way. It's a very complex and mysterious process, so there's a lot to be done there. I, I hope that's one of the things that gets figured out in the next 20 or 30 years. Good evening, sir. My name is Navtha. I'm from Gurgaon, and I'm uh, in the 11th grade. So I have more than one question. Uh, my first question is, do you believe that sometime in the future, um, we'll reach a level um, um, where we can artificially manipulate our genes um, so that we do not, so that like we remove the defective parts of our yeah. bodies, such as diseases, cancer, yeah. stuff like that? Well, that's happening now, right? I mean, that's, it was happening even before CRISPR in a very inefficient, difficult way. Now CRISPR has made it much easier, and the first results of clinical trials where CRISPR-mediated gene editing has been used to cure diseases are starting to come out. I mean, it's definitely happening already. Uh, do you believe that's ethical? Um, I have no problem with using any gene editing method to correct DNA to cure a disease in the so-called somatic cells. Mm -hmm. So it's, you're manipulating, say, the patient's body. But the controversy comes in when you're manipulating the DNA in the germline so that now 
their children and children's children carry the edited DNA. Mm -hmm. That changes what we are as humans, right? It raises all kinds of practical and ethical considerations. Mm -hmm. but that's where the big debate is. Um, my second question is, um, during the process of evolution, I know we're still evolving, but like in the beginning, um, during the RNA stage, um, was there a certain point which decided what evolution would look like? Or was it kind of like a, I mean, how, how was the process? Could you <laughs> elaborate? Yeah, I guess one, maybe one way of thinking about that is at the, at the stage of chemistry, right, everything is following the laws of chemistry and physics. And so in a sense, what, what happens is, is deterministic, right? There's chemical reactions, you know, go or don't go depending on the, the physical conditions and, and the molecules that might react. But once you get into a Darwinian evolutionary stage, then the outcome of the process is no longer deterministic. You have so many possible sequences that you can't sample all possibilities. And so a given, say, lineage will be a particular sequence that leads to certain outcomes, and a different sequence may lead to different outcomes. And so it becomes fundamentally unpredictable at, at a certain level of complexity. And, and that's really one of the hallmarks of biology, right? It doesn't follow the same deterministic laws of chemistry and physics because things can diverge indefinitely. So there's no way we can predict what we'll, how we'll evolve in the future. Yeah, that's, well, that's it. Difficult and subtle question. You know, it, yes, fundamentally, I think that's correct. You can't really predict. If you knew exactly what the conditions were and how evolution might, what the easiest solution to evolve was, there might be some cases where you can make some predictions. But fundamentally and over the long term, you know, if you look at the history of life, right, it's evolved in, in so many different directions. I think it's fundamentally unpredictable. Thank you so much. We got you. Hello, Professor. So I am Aditya. I'm a second year physics undergraduate here at Ashoka. Um, so I've, I've recently developed sort of an interest in neuroscience and consciousness. Um, so my question to you is, you, you talked about um, the experiment that made amino acids. And so essentially what you're trying to do here is, uh, we have the chemistry of life, and we have, now we are studying the geological conditions that were there at the time on Earth. And now in the lab we are trying to see if the chemistry and the geology together create the biological molecules mm -hmm. that are there in life. So even, like, even if we create the biological molecules, um, sort of how do we, like, what are your thoughts on how do we make the journey from creating, say, amino acids or proteins to creating, like, a unicellular organism first, and then what we call conscious organisms, so, like, tests of, like, like, um, yeah, like is there any yeah. tests of consciousness that you can do on those organisms um, and see, yeah, so that yeah. is the question. Yeah, so, uh, okay, there's a lot of questions there. I, I think that going from the building blocks of life, the right molecules, to having primitive cells, as the way I diagram from cell membranes and replicating RNA. I think, you know, in principle, that's quite simple. And I think we'll be able to do it in the lab in the coming years. And then as life continued to evolve and become more complex and adapt to its environments, you know, first you get to the stage of, say, uh, bacteria, like organisms that are like bacteria, right? They're pretty complicated. Thousands of genes, thousands of reactions. And then, you know, it takes another, what, three plus billion years to get to us. And so I think one of the big mysteries that remains to be explained is the evolution of, say, of the mind, maybe more generally of humanity. I think uh, it's one of the most interesting questions there is in science. 
Uh, you know, whether we'll really be, ever be able to understand that, I, I, I couldn't say. Uh, but, I mean, there, one of the interesting questions is now with the emergence of these large language uh, models and the chat GPT type things, we're starting to see emergent behaviors that even the creators of those neural networks didn't predict. And, you know, does that mean that there might be a path towards the evolution or the, the construction of artificial minds? I, know, I think it's super interesting. I don't know the answer. I think there's some other questions here. Um, hi. So a phrase I've seen used to describe like the work RA Pharmaceuticals does or did was um, complement-based therapeutics. So I was wondering if you could talk about what that means. I'm sorry, could you say that again? I didn't quite understand. Oh, yeah. So a word or like phrase that I've seen used to describe what RA Pharmaceuticals, um, the pharmaceutical company that you were involved with, does um, is complement-based therapeutics. And yes, I was yes. wondering if you could talk about what that means. Oh, OK. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so, so the second company that I helped start, it's called Raw Pharma, and, and it was based on, on circular peptides with highly modified amino acids, right? which we could use the principles of evolution to find sequences that would bind to, in principle, basically any protein. So the question is, what, what are good targets to go after? And so uh, what they decided in, in the company was to go after one of the components of what's called the complement system. This is part of a branch of the overall immune system, uh, part of the innate immune system. It's uh, incredibly complicated uh, biochemistry, but there's a key protein in there that uh, is kind of at the nexus of a lot of signaling pathways and activation pathways. And so uh, we found uh, uh, a, a small cyclic modified peptide that could bind and, and inhibit this protein. And so in some diseases where this protein is kind of uncontrolled, it can have beneficial effects. Uh, hi, sir. Great talk. Thank you so much for that. Uh, since you worked in both genetics and are trying to look into the origins of life, I just really wanted to ask you something about hitchhiking. Um, since it's fairly well established that hitchhiking lowers variation in a population, uh, it still seems to be fairly pervasive in uh, Saccharomyces populations, I think. Considering, and considering you have worked with Saccharomyces, I just wanted to um, ask you about what you think how hitchhiking came to be the, the way it is right now. If you could like answer this off the top of your head. Because if it's lowering variation, it's not really helping evolution because in, in a nutshell, what evolution says is the more variation it is, the better it is. I'm not sure I caught the, exactly what you were saying. The, how what is prevalent in? Uh, genetic hitchhiking. Genetic? Hitchhiking. Hitchhiking. Ah. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, you know, the process of evolution is all kinds of complexities, right? And, and so there's uh, genetic hitchhiking is when, you, when there's a mutation that's beneficial and starts to take over the population, then regions of DNA around that, where that mutation is, tend to get enriched because they don't get separated by recombination. So I think that's a pretty universal evolutionary process. Um, how far back that goes is not clear. Uh, there are some experiments that suggest that recombination between RNA molecules can happen through different pathways. So uh, recombination or the lack of it could influence hitchhiking at very early stages. And you know, of course, it's, it's seen in everything from you know, bacteria to humans. I see that, but once, uh, once the organisms or the population has passed through that stage in, it, in evolutionary time scales, uh, yeah. why does that phenotype not get eliminated over time? Something along those lines. Well, the only way to eliminate the idea, the, 
phenomenon of genetic hitchhiking would be to have more and more recombination, right? Which recombination itself is a somewhat dangerous process <laughs> and, and can lead to new mutations. So it probably is a cost-benefit uh, outcome. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Akirno, and I enjoyed your talk. I have two questions. The first is uh, fairly simple. One is how how long does the atmosphere remain reducing after an asteroid impact? Is it like only for a few hours, or is it like for a thousand years? It could be for thousands of years, up to millions of years, for a very large, really large impact. Um, this is all based on modeling, which. There are a number of huge uncertainties. Uh, so a lot of people arguing about this question right now. And my second question is, you mentioned unnatural peptides. I was wondering, is the reason they are natural is that they're not suited for life? Or is it just random chance that those peptides are not, are not in our bodies, but other peptides are? Like, could you make an alternative biochemistry, like one that would emerge on alien planets out of these alternative peptides, or are the peptides in the bodies those pep chosen or were evolved because they're the only peptide yeah. suitable for life? Yeah, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and, and so this actually applies uh, both to these, the set of amino acids that are used to make peptides, right? It also applies to the set of nucleotides that are used to make RNA and DNA. And you can ask, why is this set and not some other set? Um, so for amino acids, the chemistry to make the simple amino acids, things like glycine, alanine, serine, valine, aspartate, that's quite simple. The pathway to make these molecules is very short. And so it's almost inevitable that they would be made and would be fairly abundant. Then there are some other amino acids that are thought to have come into the genetic code at a very late stage, like uh, phenylalanine, tyrosine, uh, a few others. And for those, you know, why they were selected and not something else is kind of an open question. It's possible that uh, life that emerged independently might have some different amino acids, depending on the environments and the local chemistry. Uh, for the building blocks of RNA, we have the same issue, right? So some, some things that look like they'd be perfectly good are either hard to make, so they would never get a chance, really, or many of them are actually destroyed by ultraviolet radiation. The ones that are actually found in our RNA tend to be the, among the most resistant to ultraviolet radiation. So there are a lot of filters, right? It's what you can make, what can survive the conditions, what's useful in an evolutionary sense. All of those things come together to determine the set of building blocks that's actually used. Good evening, sir. This is Punya Chaudhary from grade 9. I'm from Mumbai. Sir, actually, I have more than a few questions. <laughs> so, sir, what inspired you to pursue research in the field of telomeres? Yeah, I got into telomeres purely by chance because I went to a scientific meeting. I met Liz Blackburn. We had a great conversation. One thing led to another. The next thing you know, we were collaborating and doing experiments, and yeah, that's how it got started. And so what were the difficulties and breakthroughs you faced during your, um, you know, exploration? Of in the yeah, area yeah. in Telomas? Yeah. Well, the first thing is we didn't think it was going to work, right? So Liz sent me some DNA, and I put it in the freezer, and I didn't even do the experiment for six or nine months, right? Because I was busy doing other stuff. And, uh, 
you know, this was kind of a low priority. But then once I did the experiment and it worked, then oh man. <laughs> and then of course we had to really focus on it. And things went quickly after that. And so can you share any recent developments or exciting discoveries in this field? Recent. Recent? So I haven't worked in this field for 30 years now. Uh, so I don't know all of the latest uh, details. Um, but uh, I can say, actually, I've heard some recent talks. The structure, the three-dimensional structure of that enzyme has just recently been worked out at atomic detail. So, so people now understand, you know, in really in great detail how it works. They also uh, are trying to determine the three-dimensional structures of other proteins that bind to telomeres. Yes. That work is progressing. But, and then there's the question if you have two huge structures. This telomerase is a big, complicated enzyme. And then there's a big complex that binds the ends of chromosomes. And these interact in a way that controls the elongation of the telomere. So this is actually still being worked out. But it's, it is, actually is very exciting to see these high resolution atomic you know, structures of these molecules. So we're getting a better understanding of how they actually do what they do. And so are there any potential applications of telomeres in, um, in anywhere except aging or cancer? Huh. Except apart from aging or cancer. Uh, I don't know, actually. I don't know. Maybe there are. I haven't thought about it. OK. So last question. <laughs> so do you have any advice for students interested in pursuing a career in a scientific field? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think, I think that most of the interesting discoveries in science come uh, sort of at the intersection of different fields. Right? So if you, just work, if you study only one narrow, small area of science, um, I think it's much less likely that you'll find something amazing and interesting, but if you say, can bring together different areas of science, say different, some aspect of chemistry and some aspect of biology, for example, that opens up so many new questions. And, and so I would recommend studying uh, both very broadly, so you have an understanding of, say, computer science and, and biochemistry or, you know, or, or aspects of physics and chemistry. You know, di different areas of science, so you can bring new discoveries together. I think that is what leads to a lot of exciting advances. In my uh, basement chemistry lab, and, uh, I was uh, uh, fairly lucky to escape serious injury, I have to say. Yeah. But it was exciting. These days, when you get chemistry sets for children, you basically can't do anything interesting as far as I can see. They're very safe, but not but they're kind of boring. Okay. We have a, oh, okay. We'll get you Good evening, next. Professor. We'll get you next. Okay. It is truly an uh, honor to have you here and to attend your uh, seminar. So I am Sri Ram. So um, I'm eager to learn if um, there are any misconceptions or um, prevalent misunderstandings um, in your field of expertise um, that you would like to share with us? Uh, sure. So in, in, think, in terms of the origin of life, I think there are many, many misconceptions. Uh, you know, if you read uh, kind of the popular literature, You'll probably hear theories about how life got started and uh, uh, hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean, you know, uh, uh, which I think is, is, is really kind of ludicrous. I mean, people, some people like that idea because there's a source of energy, but of course there's much more energy available on the surface where, where you have sunlight, UV, geological processes. Uh, and yeah, it's, to me it's, it's it's one of those bad ideas that just won't go away, no matter how much evidence there is against it. It's kind of bizarre, actually. Uh, so that's, that's just one. But there are, 
there are you know all kinds of misconceptions about it because probably because there's not enough general understanding of what evolution is, how it works, and understanding of chemistry and and well, I'll give you another example actually. I, I kind of like this one. Uh, so there's a uh, scientist, uh, 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 shall we remain nameless, who's an extremely good organic chemist. Right? He has made incredibly complicated molecules. He's made organic molecules that are in the shape of a racing car and that can move along a gold surface. It's really remarkable. And yet, this guy does not think that it is possible that life evolved all by itself on, this, on the early Earth. And the reason he doesn't think it's possible is that he can't see how molecules could be purified, could accumulate could engage in sequential reactions. But that's only because he doesn't want to think about it. You know, key intermediates can crystallize out so you can wash away impurities. That can happen in nature. It does happen in nature. Um, you can easily imagine environments that bring molecules together and allow them to do one thing after another. So I think the limitations, the conceptual limitations uh, like that, have slowed down progress in the field by a lot. Right? And, and, and so when you come to a mystery, a question that you don't know the answer to in science, you can either give up and say it's not possible, or you can say, wow, that's a really interesting scientific challenge. How do I think about it? Right. Great question. Good morning, sir. My name is Asfia, and I'm from Pune. I have a question for you that, uh, like, uh, you talked about revolution. Uh, so uh, do you think uh, in future that another species of people will replace human beings like dinosaurs disappear? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, you know. Uh, yeah, I think it's one of those things that's it's kind of unpredictable, right? We don't know what the future holds. Uh, yeah, I think it's something that's kind of hard to answer. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shravni. Um, I'm from Pune. Actually, I'm very grateful to have this conversation with you because I have been researching in parts past about your research, and I'm pretty interested in that. Um, my question to you was that I currently research from one to two years about the question that if cells replicate uh, and the telomeres decrease, is there any possibility that it will not decrease and it will stay the same? But whereas I feel that the humans will grow and grow and it would be a bulky thing. So do you think like in biotechnology right now, how DNA is getting edited and um, how de desirable human beings are being produced? Like that, do you think that by the biotechnology, is it possible that um, uh, the cells replicate, we doesn't grow from outside and become huge, but whereas all the things work and we don't age? Yeah, so, yeah, there's been a few other questions in that area. The answer is that it's, it's, it's basically, it's complicated, right? You, because you can't, you can't do it in a simple way. Other, because if you just turn on telomerase everywhere, then the incidence of cancer would probably go up. So if we could turn it on at the right amount, in the right cells, at the right time, it might, be, it might help a little bit. But there's also, it's not the only thing that's involved in aging, right? There's damage to DNA. There's reactive oxygen species. There's protein cross-linking. There are many things that contribute to aging. So there's not one magic cure, even to long race. Yeah. Good evening, sir. As you're s over here. Uh, ah, so yes. as you keep speaking, I, my mind keeps racing up and coming up with more and more questions. But I promise <laughs> this is going to be my last question. So you spoke about uh, evolution in uh, aptomy. Oh, sorry. Aptomers, yeah. and you spoke about how aptomers are similar to antibodies. Yeah. Do you think aptomers could bind to, let's say, antibodies or proteins? Yes, they can. Yes, absolutely. 
the, but the reason that people are trying to use aptamers as a therapy, as drugs, is because you can just make them by chemical synthesis. Uh, they're well-defined. Um, but the reason it's been challenging is that you need to use more sophisticated chemistry so that they last inside the body. They don't get degraded. They go to the right places. It's hard to get them to go into cells, so that means you have to look at targets outside of cells, although that may be changing. So there's a whole series of challenges on the way from um, an interesting molecule to something that acts like a drug. And that's really been what the problem is. Hello, had a quick question. Um, I've been fascinated with the Miller's experiment. Can you reiterate once again what the power source for that experiment was? What the... The power source. Oh, in the original Miller experiment, it was uh, an electric discharge, so high voltage between two electrodes, so you make a, essentially a, a spark uh, discharge. And so that basically rips the electrons off of molecules so that they become very uh, reactive. Uh, it would be equivalent to what you could get from, say, lightning uh, strikes in the early atmosphere. Uh, but you can get the same kind of chemistry from uh, UV radiation or from uh, high pressure and temperature from the shock wave of an impact. There are many ways of getting essentially the same outcome when, when you supply a very powerful source of energy. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor. So um, in your lecture, you were talking about how scientists believe that um, what life originated from protocells and then you know evolved into complex cells. But yeah. how exactly uh, what, what do you theorize that it happened? <laughs> so there's many, many steps, right? So yeah, we're just trying to understand the first, the first steps. I think the next interesting questions, assuming we can make a protocell that can evolve, uh, then there's the question of how, do you, how did protein synthesis evolve? Uh, another really interesting question is how did metabolism evolve, right? So we begin with chemistry going on in the environment and cells living off of that, but eventually they learned how to make everything they need inside. So there's whole interesting questions there. Uh, and then, yeah, the list of questions goes on and on and on. I think we'll be studying it for a long time. <laughs>